Ladies and gentlemen, on this particular channel, we've taken a look at FFmpeg before on several different occasions. In the past, we've looked at FFmpeg as primarily a conversion tool. We've seen that it does, you know, some interesting things like cropping, scaling, and rotating. But in fact, this program is so much more than that. FFmpeg can do a whole lot of advanced features and in some cases can even actually edit a video. This week, let's take a look at some more advanced FFmpeg filters and operations. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. In this particular video, we're going to take a look at some of the more advanced filters that are present within FFmpeg. So this video is going to be quite short, quite light. I'm going to be just introducing you to those effects as well as showing you a little bit of how to customize each one of them. Next week, we're going to actually take a look at some of the more advanced features within FFmpeg. And this includes how to string multiple filters together. And we're also going to look at how we can actually use FFmpeg to properly edit a video, to make cuts in them and throw away certain parts of the video. So yeah, without further ado, let's jump into taking a look at our filters. Before we begin, let's start with a very quick recap of FFmpeg syntax. I'm just going to very quickly go through what syntax there is. If you need more detailed instruction about this, you should check out the older video. Anyway, this is what FFmpeg syntax generally looks like. You'll want to first use dash i to specify your input file. You can optionally include some filters using a filter string, which I will talk about on a different slide. And of course, at the end of the day, you do need to specify an output file name. Since this is all about filters, let's spend more time looking at the filter string itself. Now, you do actually have to type everything together on one line, but it's not very clear what it actually means. So for the sake of clarity, I'm going to actually split this out into multiple lines. You of course have to start with a dash VF, which stands for video filters. Surround your entire filter string by quotes, and on the inside, this is what you write. First of all, you have to start with a filter. Whatever the name of a filter is, simply type it in. And if you actually want to give it more settings, which usually you do, then also add an equal sign. To specify the settings, you're going to have to use basically a setting name equals to the value you want to set it to. So yeah, it's basically a key value pair. You want to mention the setting name equals the value you want to set it to. If you have multiple settings, separate it with the colon character. You can specify multiple filters as well, and in order to separate them, you'll want to use a comma. So yeah, in this case, there are actually two filters, as you can see, one filter with its settings, comma, and the next filter. So yeah, that's essentially what the filter string syntax looks like. So alright, let's start by taking a look at our video editing filters. Now, let's start with sharpening. Of course, many cameras these days produce footage that, you know, is a little bit soft, so sharpening is always helpful. As you can see, this is a clean shot out of my DSLR camera, and you can see that, you know, the edges are sort of blurry. Let's make use of the unsharp filter to make it better. So let's look at a very quick before and after before we continue. Now, this is before, this is after. Now, you might argue that the changes are a little subtle, which I would tend to agree, but if you look closely at the lines here, well, they do seem to be a little bit more clear. To do this in FFmpeg, you'll want to make use of the unsharp filter. Now, the basic command call is to simply use dash filter and say unsharp. By default, a pretty decent job is already done, but of course, we can actually change the filter size to make the effects even more apparent. To do this, you want to use LX and LY, which actually specifies the filter size in the horizontal and vertical directions. By default, both these values are set to 3, and that is the result you see on the far left. Bringing it up to 7 gives you the results in the center, which of course appear sharper. And bringing it up some more to 13, 
well, makes the effect really prominent. In fact, a little bit too much so if you ask me. Apart from changing this, you can also change the LA value, which actually represents the intensity of the effect. By default, it is set to 1.0, which gives you the effect on the far left. Increasing it to 1.5, of course, makes the effect stronger. And interestingly, if you were to actually use a negative value, you end up blurring the image. What this means is the unsharp filter also doubles up as a blur filter, if you ever have the need to do that. Alright, let's move on to our next filter. Now, of course, the pictures coming straight out of your camera does not necessarily have to be, you know, really clear, really nice and bright. But that's where editing actually comes in, where you can actually tweak up things like brightness, contrast and saturation. Once again, here's a before and after. Now, I've done this operation on a JPEG image, but you can of course as easily do this to a video. Now, here's one thing that's good to tweak. You can actually tweak the contrast of a video. Now, in this particular case, 1.0 actually means no change. Reducing this value gives you less contrast. As you can see, this image feels more, well, washed out. And increasing the value beyond one gives you a more contrasty image. You probably don't want to overdo this. Values around 1.3 are good. A little bit more, a little bit less will be fine but not too much more. Brightness, well that's self-explanatory, you make the image brighter or darker. It defaults at zero which means no change. Reducing the value, in other words making it go under zero makes the image darker and increasing it makes it brighter. Saturation is of course what you expect, it defaults to one. Increasing it makes the colors more apparent and more vivid, whereas decreasing the value makes the colors go closer to monochrome. Now, you can also find gamma adjustments. For example, in this case, I'm actually tweaking the gamma for the red channel. Once again, it defaults to one, and that means, well, it looks exactly like it used to. Reducing the value actually reduces the median amount of red, creating a cyanish looking image, which is what we have right here on the left. Increasing it increases the median amount of red, of course, giving us a reddish image. Of course, using the EQ filter to tweak color might be a little bit counterintuitive. So let's move on to take a look at the color balance tool, which of course, well, is more suitable for this purpose. Now, there are actually nine different settings in the color balance tool because, well, this is meant to be strictly a color adjustment tool. The cool thing is you can actually change the amount of red, green and blue, for the shadows, midtones, and highlight segments of the image separately. This basically allows you to do full on color grading. You can do many cool effects as we will see in a couple of slides. Now, let's take a look at this one here. Basically what I've done is for the red shadows, I've actually reduced it a little. And for the blue shadows, I've increased it a little. The net effect of doing this is that the darkest parts of the image now take on a bluish tint. You can actually see it, well, in a lot of these areas. Then the next thing I've done is for the highlights, I've increased the red a little and decreased the blue a little. You can of course see this in the sky, which has now taken on a slight reddish color. Now, here's another example on the same image. Now, the shadows have been pushed towards green, which you can of course see here. And the highlights have been pushed towards a very light purple. And that, of course, is still visible here. One more example before we wrap this up. All I've done here is significantly increase the red in the shadows and decrease the blue in the shadows as well. You can actually see the reddish tints in a lot of these areas. All right, let us move on to the fun stuff. And that would be the audio visualizations. Now, in order to do this, we actually have to tweak the command a little. Of course, the input is now an audio file. But more crucially, the filter now needs to be filter underscore complex. Now, the first thing you'd probably want to do is to generate a waveform. You can use the show waves filter to do this, and there are basically, you know, two particularly different modes, one being the line mode, and the other being the centered line mode. As you can see in both these examples, you can see sort of three different colors. 
In fact, the left channel is rendered in red, the right channel is rendered in green. So when you actually see a yellowish orangey color, that is when the wave is actually present on both sides. So yeah, this is actually a very interesting way of picturing sound. You can of course use the size argument to change up the size of the visualization. If you don't actually use this, the original size of the visualization can be quite small, it can be quite low resolution, so you are recommended to use this if required. Next up is frequency, which of course is done using this particular filter, and yeah, the idea is this is a histogram showing you, well, the lowest frequencies on the left and the highest frequencies all the way on the right. Again, this method uses two different colors to show you the difference between the left and right channels. Now, for both of these two techniques we've just seen, you can actually change up the color. And for both these filters, the name of the argument is the same, and that is colors. Basically, you have to write colors equal to and a set of colors separated by the pipe symbol. What I'm assuming here is that you have a stereo input and therefore you can only supply two colors, one for the left channel, another for the right channel. Of course, if you're recording something that has even more channels than that, then of course, feel free to add more colors. Here's a frequency graph showing you blue and purple for the left and right channels respectively. As you can see, the colors look something like this. Now, here's another one that's more interesting. I've actually included hex color codes instead of the names of colors, and both of these methods actually work. Since these two colors are actually sort of inverses of each other, adding them together creates white. And so that creates this very interesting effect here. Now, moving away from the two visualization methods we've just seen, here is a very interesting one called Show CQT. Now, I'm going to go quiet and actually let you listen to the piano piece, you know, in conjunction with this visualization. And I want you to take note of how this is essentially showing you which piano keys are being pressed. Cool, huh? Now, let's move on to our last audio visualization, which is the A vector scope. It's actually a vector scope plots the difference between the left and right channels by actually plotting them on the vertical and horizontal axis. And what you actually get at the end of the day is this very nice sort of radial pattern. Now, for this, you can actually tweak several different color settings, which gives you very different results. By changing RC, GC, and BC, you're actually changing the contrast of the red, green, and blue channels. In this particular case, I've given a lot of contrast to the red and blue channels, creating a purple kind of look. This is the default settings, which is mostly greenish and somewhat bluish. And this is another variant, which is mostly blue. But this is not the only thing that influences the color. You see, over time, the colors actually fade out, and you can influence how quickly each color fades out. To do this, you want to use the RF, GF, and BF parameters. And well, the larger the number, the faster a particular color fades out. In this case, I've actually made red fade out the slowest, which is why most of the colors you see here is red. This is the default, which actually makes blue fade out the slowest, which is why you see a lot of blue. And yeah, this is another variant in which green disappears very quickly and that's why you see mostly purple left behind. For even more visual interest, you can actually change the draw mode to line. By using the draw parameter and setting it to line, you can more clearly see, well, the patterns that are actually drawn out by the differences in audio between the left and right channels. Alright, let us move on to our last part, which is video visualizations. Now, this might seem a little bit strange. I mean, audio visualizations make sense because, well, you want to turn audio into a form that is visible. But as it turns out, video data can be visualized in a different way as well. Let's start with the vector scope. 
Now, if you've been following the rest of my videos as well, you will remember some time ago we actually talked about, you know, expressing digital data in analog forms, and at the end we actually talked about using vector scopes to visualize video. Well, we have an example right here. Essentially what this does is, well, all the colors are being shown in a circle, and well, whatever colors there are in the image is shown as lines that actually move in the appropriate direction of the color. Turns out you can generate this with FFmpeg using the vector scope filter. Now, by default, if you were to just call the vector scope filter, the result is kind of boring looking. Well, first of all, it's very low resolution. Turns out the really only way to fix this is to, well, change the format of the input video using a completely different filter. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm setting the format here to a slightly different one, which generates a larger vector scope. Still, this is monochrome, not so fun. You can actually use the mode setting to change it up to a different look. Since this is more colorful, I think it, you know, sort of conveys the idea in a clearer manner. But yeah, of course, well, since this is color, this is color 4. There are actually several different settings in between that I won't go into detail. I think these two that are shown here are the best looking of the lot. Now, you can also introduce what are known as graticules, and these are just little labels around the edge of the vector scope that tell you what color each different angle actually corresponds to. You can have these graticules appear in green or in the actual color they represent. Now, as a little added bonus, you know, as our extra 10th filter, well, you can actually express this same idea in a slightly different manner using the CIE scope filter. So this is just a different way of representing the same information, but this looks more colorful in a way, so you might want to use this instead. Let's move on to our last video visualization, the waveform. Now, this one doesn't seem to make a lot of sense until you actually see it alongside the actual video. Now, I've had to do quite a bit of, you know, FFmpeg trickery to get this one to work, but essentially what's happening here is that, well, I've overlaid the original video on top of two different versions of the waveform. As you can see when played back, it turns out that the waveform at the bottom is actually showing the intensities of each column of the image, while the waveform on the left is showing the intensities of each row. So yeah, in a way this is just a brightness meter with a spatial component to it, and to choose between the row mode or the column mode, well, just use the mode parameter. On top of this setting, you can actually also configure it to show color information. And to do that, you want to use the component setting. Now, it seems like this is actually, you know, a bit mask of some kind. And specifying components equal to 7 means you want to show all three channels. This is actually showing this as three different waveforms. If you want, you can also combine them all together by saying display equals overlay. So yeah, that is the waveform, our last filter for today. And there you have it. Hopefully by just taking a look at these 9 different filters available within FFmpeg, well, you are convinced that FFmpeg is more than just a conversion tool, but it's also a pretty good editing and visualization tool. That's all there is for this episode. Do of course stay tuned for our follow up next week, in which we'll actually talk about some advanced techniques including how to string multiple of those filters we've just seen together into one video. Again, that's all there is for this particular video. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.